Everybody's got a story, you just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and welcome back for season two of Good Listen. And when I was a little kid, I was obsessed with the show Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous with Robin Leach. They used to like do videos of all these celebrities and their homes and rich people and how they lived, and it was really cool. And I've always really been into finding out more about them, like how they are in real life. Funny side note, I, I used to work with a boss who I would always know where the richest person in the room is because he would be gravitated toward me. He just loved talking to rich people too. So today I've got Julie Macklow on the podcast. And if you were to Google her, it would probably say that she's a socialite. But Julie Macklow is way more than just a quote unquote socialite. And we're going to get into that in a minute. Uh, she's an amazing serial entrepreneur who's done a lot in business, including starting her own brown spirits company, Macklow. And we'll get into that as well. We're also going to talk about the Met Gala and what it's like keeping track of all your clothes when you have multiple homes. Yeah, I know. First world problems. Julie Macklow, welcome to Good Listen. How are you? Hi, thanks for having me. So happy to be here. I'm so glad you're here because the last time I saw you, and you're not going to remember this, was last year when you uh, unveiled a new Maclo whiskey. You had a little like private shindig in your place in Manhattan. And it was mostly like, yeah, there it is. It was mostly like restaurateur people, media people. So that's how I got, I got in. But as I've told you in the past, Julie, I'm not a, a brown spirits drinker. So it was a very quiet room, if you remember. And you said, okay, for the first time, everyone's going to drink this. So everyone takes their sips, and all of a sudden, all you hear in the room is me do this. I was, like, just not prepared for it, and I felt so embarrassed. Like, all these people were, like, giving me, like, the I remember the that was eye. in my apartment. Yes, yes. So uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to that, but also I want to apologize for being the, the, the green thumb or the person who stuck out of the whole thing. But congratulations on that latest spirit. How, is that, how, how did that go over outside of my first impressions of it? It went well. So I, I think you were there for the first release of actually our Kentucky edition. We're now on our third bottling of it. So, you know, it all continues. And then we've got, you know, our original private collection, which I think you also tasted. Yep. We just came out actually with our 12-year release, which is about to hit the market. So um, it's it's been a journey, needless to say. But we'll get into all those details, yes. I'm sure, in a bit. Absolutely. All right, and let's get into that journey because if anyone were to Google you, Julie, and I don't know if you've ever done this yourself. Crazy the, person comes up. <laughs> no, 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 not crazy. It's all positive. Well, I guess it depends on, on perspective. But the one the <laughs> one thing that comes up, it says Julie Macklow socialite. And it's I've, it's one of those things like I've never met a socialite. And, and I know the word socialite has this weird meaning that it's basically like rich people who don't really have a day job and like just live live their best lives. But you're obviously not that. Like, you're a serial entrepreneur, you've run multiple companies, been very successful in finance. So when you see that, that you're described as a quote-unquote socialite, what, first of all, what does that mean to you? It's so funny you say that. So I feel like the first time it really struck me is I remember, like, back in the day, Tinsley Mortimer was, like, Ooh. the socialite, and there was, like, a full page six, and, like, there was some, like, mention of me in it. And I was like, Oh my God, what is a socialite and why am I even mentioning this? <laughs> and, you know, I've just come to accept that, as you say, it's like I think if you live on the Upper East Side and you come from a well off family, you just get labeled that way. The reality is, you know, I worked in finance, I ran the consumer retail for guys like Steve Cohen and Izzy Englander, and I was on Home Shopping Network with my um, skincare and cosmetics company for almost seven years. But I think socialite goes back to the events and gala scene, just to answer your question, yeah. in New York City. And as somebody who went to the Met Gala, I think 15 years in a row, and I lived across the street and still do as you came to my home yeah. for the whiskey event. And I used to go to tons of galas actually with my whiskey in hand and my big <laughs> ball gown. And to this day, even the other day, I was in the Hamptons and somebody's like, I still remember you in the giant big blue Oscar day of Lorenta dress with like your whiskey in your hand and you're the only female drinking whiskey. So I think that's where the socialite turn comes. Whereas New York society, especially pre-social media and pre-Instagram influencers used to be, still is run by a very small group of people who are very tied into the charity gala benefit scene. It definitely has changed a little bit post-COVID, but pre-COVID for sure it went this way. Now, I think socialite was the term. 
that was used as a female who was, you know, engaged in that network of philanthropy and, you know, going to these events, going to the opera, going to the Met Gala. And the reality is I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. It's just not a term I think of myself as doing. No, absolutely. And that's why when I first saw it, I was like, yeah, to me, a socialite is, like you said, someone who comes from influence, you know, someone who's doing stuff with their with their work, with their net worth. But the fact that you've had all these careers, like you probably look at them like these people never worked a day in their life. I, I, was, I, I There's a lot of fake jobs, too. I mean, there are a lot of people who yes. have fake jobs. So, you know, I think there there is a lot of people in that network also who are married into guys who are extremely successful. There are women who are extremely successful. I would say more in the old days, it would be that more like the, you know, women worked less. And if you were wealthy enough, the expectation would be that your husband would be the one who would be earning the money. Right. And you would be the caregiver of your kids. And that was just never how I was bred and, you know, so I think socialite, when I think of the term, that's what it makes me think of. So I think, like, oh, I'm not a socialite. I actually <laughs> have a real job, to your point. But, you know, hopefully that term's not as relevant as it used to be. Here, no. No doubt. Uh, and let's pull on that thread because you mentioned Met Gala and you, you bit, went a bunch of years. I've never gone. And I would never be invited to such a such thing. But, like, can you take us behind the curtain? I'm not giving you one even yet. So you'll appreciate this. Yeah. The last one I went to, I was dressed as basically. Glenda the Good Witch, hot pink feather dress. Um, it was done custom by the designer who went with me. Um, LED, you know, was that called a crown on my head? I could barely get out my front door because so many people are there. Finally, they wouldn't let me walk across the street. So I had to go literally in high heels all the way around up Madison, across 86th Street, back down to the Met. I live literally across the street. Wow. And- so that was enough. Then you're in like the receiving line to go in. And I remember the one thing I had under my dress was a flask and like my garter. <laughs> and I was standing in line and Jeff Bezos was literally right next to me. He's like, what is in that flask? And can I have a sip? I'm like, I have whiskey in my flask. And like, so, so he had a sip of my flask. This is probably, you know, 2019 that this happened. Wow. But the Met Gala definitely... I'd say 10 years ago, used to be more socialites, more business people, more like real A-list celebrities. Now it became much more influencers. Um, Half the people who go there, I don't even know who they are. And it feels like everyone's just trying to dress naked at this point. (laughs) So I I don't think it is what it used to be. I for sure don't have any FOMO for not attending in the last two years. I'm just annoyed that I can't get out my front door without right the traffic and such. Yeah, (laughs) it's impossible. So, um, you know, I think though, when it used to be a thing, it was like you know, no one really knew the Kardashians. They were there like socializing, and Taylor Swift was there talking to you. It used to be like a very small, very highly curated dinner, like the real who's who. And they had some, you know, New Yorkers and they'd have some L.A. people and they'd have some real business people. It was a very spread out thing. Today, I think it's generally a giant shit show, if I can say so. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously, I don't care if I don't get invited back. (laughs) It it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like you would be fine without the the Met Gala. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, it's not clear. I looked. The Met's a great institution. Yeah. I'm all for raising money for it. But, you know, they probably don't need more money either. Just going to say that. No, no doubt. Uh, the the Jeff Bezos thing, the twi- uh, around 2019, wouldn't yeah. So the the flask, because from one of the stories I've read is that pe- by the time people get inside, they're like starving. There's there's not a lot of food. Oh, my God, that cocktail. So if you're a nobody like me, you have to go on like the first reservation time, which is like 6.30 p.m. Just okay. for then perspective, like Ma- Madonna and Beyonce come at 9 p.m. So there's like a three and a half hour cocktail no food, terrible alcohol, and you're just like waiting. And then finally you let in, there's a, you know, beautiful seat of dinner. There's always some fabulous performer. I still remember Lady Gaga one year performed. It was incredible in the Temple of Dender. But the reality is then by the end of it, it's sort of done by 12. And then there's after party. But 
I just always walked across the street and went. <laughs> yeah, you got home. One year I made it to the Gucci after party and that was like, okay, one and done. I'm going back to sleep. Usually they were downtown. And I was like, there's no way I'm leaving the Upper East Side to go downtown at midnight. <laughs> That's so great. Uh, it's so funny. So you for three hours, you're waiting in like a cocktail hour, or like in a cocktail hour. It's like a three hour cocktail party. But like, what are you doing? Just walking around and eating like little mini hot dogs? It was like you're like a lurker. Like you're like trying to talk to people. No one's super friendly because, you know, look, the one thing I tell people, New Yorkers are not the friendliest bunch. Like that's just, a, and if you're in the Upper East Side, they're really even less friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then you start to put it's not like going to Dallas where everyone's like, Hey, how are you? Let's be best friends. It's like and so then you get like the who's who of like sort of the entire country there. And I would not say everyone's sort of like staring at each other and looking them down and like but no one's super friendly there. And so my fr friend, girlfriend, my husband went with me once or twice. I think he's, he's like, I'm never going again. So my girlfriend I used to go. And she and I would just walk up to people and be like, hey, how are you? And we'd like start having random conversations. I think people are so perplexed, like that we were just like trying to talk to them out of nowhere. But I think in this weird way, because we were so disarming about it, we did like get speech to the Kardashians and like to Taylor Swift and all these celebrities. Half of them I didn't honestly even know who they were half the time. But it was, you know, it used to be a very small gathering i'd say it was four or five hundred people one year it was even like 300 um i think it's much larger now so wow it, it was more intimate then too awesome well well thank you for taking me back behind the curtain there uh one question i have about you you know looking you up is you have multiple homes which is um, it sounds really cool and for a while i was splitting time between new york city and charleston i'm basically 99 percent of the time in charleston but the one thing i always had trouble with was what clothes do i have where do I bring oh my, my favorite God. sweater with I'm, me? I'm, 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 you're going to laugh. Okay, so there's a story. So I'm married this year 20 years to my husband. We met blind date in, I don't know, 2004, maybe it's three. Wait, no, she's going to be like, you don't have that date right. We were married in 2004. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> it's a long, long time ago, yeah. never mind. Anyway, so finally last year, I used to always bring all my clothes from like the Hamptons where it's summer weather back to New York City. Finally, last summer, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to leave my summer clothes in the house in the Hamptons. I was like, so I guess you know you're really stuck with me at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, because I, I would slap them back and forth, and then it dawned on me one day. I'm like, wait, I have ski clothes in Aspen, because even if you're in Aspen summer, you're like wearing Patagonia. It's not a dressy place. The Hamptons are fairly dressy in summer, even, you know, at a dinner, people are wearing a nice dress. And even though it's like casual versus New York City, it's still fancy. And then New York City is just, you know, super dressy or casual. Now it's more homeless, so you blend in with the people <laughs> who want to go try and mug you on the streets. But right. I realized that the actual clothing options do not quite cross over and that I can leave my clothes at each separate location. And this just happened last year. So <laughs> oh, that's funny. For the last, like... 20 years I've been schlepping clothes back and forth every beginning of season and end it with and then it's like why am I doing this I'm not exactly sure but it is actual real thing oh yeah no trust me it was a struggle for me and then eventually what I did was I basically did what you did I just schlep everything our car would be waiting we couldn't fly because we were bringing so much crap so we would have to All drive the our way back. it was such well, a pain for COVID you'll laugh so when COVID happened March 10th or whatever I remember I'll never forget I got a U-Haul and I was like I was like baby we're gonna be out there for a while and I packed into that U-Haul all my clothes including some ball gowns <laughs> <laughs> just in case just in case like where did I think I was going <laughs> oh my god it was quite funny I mean my husband's like I cannot even and lots of toilet paper there's like unlimited oh, of amounts of toilet paper at our house but yeah so Did you I, ever I'm, get I'm the chance to use ball gowns that you took out there, or, or there no opportunity? Yeah, they're still like in the cedar closet. Like the ball gowns and the shotguns are together. I mean, <laughs> like who's using those? Hopefully, never. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, hope not. Uh, no, it's not. funny you talk about the Hamptons. Go as a Jersey guy, I was always a Jersey short person, so never really went out to the Hamptons. But the times I went, I was like. It's great once you get there, but man, what a freaking pain of the ass is to oh get out God. here. Yeah. It How is do such you guys a deal with it. So you know. 
the reality is, as somebody who goes back and forth, love my husband. He parks out there all sm- summer. He's clearly smarter than me. He's like, the kids in camp there. I'm going to move out. I can't go yeah. paint surf every day. You can tell which one of us actually is smarter. I go back and forth because of work. I will say I do take, when possible, the seaplane service, okay. which is a game changer if you're going out on a you know, Thursday or Friday versus four hours in traffic. Um, If it's just, you know, a Tuesday morning, driving is quick, right? It's two hours. It's really catching those bad Fridays and Thursdays that can just, you can send traffic forever. It's crazy. I was supposed to go there last night when I landed from Iceland and come back this morning. I'm like, there's just no way. I'm like, I'm going straight into New York City. My parents are like, what? You're not going to see us? I'm like, sorry. I saw you before you left. <laughs> well, see you. No, I'll see you later. Yeah, I see you. It's all right. Um, yeah. And, and, and we're recording this in the summer of 2024, smack in the summer. Um, and we're, you know, for folks who don't live in New York, all you hear in the media is like how much it's different. The times I've gone back recently, it's the, the difference is pretty stark for a New Yorker. Um, for someone who's been there for multiple decades, um, what's it really like? And, and obviously, I know you're living the good life, but still, you're still no, in New York. It's a, so, you know, back in the day, let's go back a decade ago, or the yeah. Bloomberg era, so maybe 15 years ago, even. You would see women walking down Mass Avenue, holding their Crocker Mez bag in their stilettos, dressed to the nines with their giant jewelry on, up and down, almost like it was Palm Beach, like, or Aspen or anything. Today, you better look like you're, like, partially, like, homeless. No, I don't wear a stitch of jewelry. Um, I try and avoid anything that's overly labeled. I mean, somebody got stabbed on my everyday walking path in Central Park yesterday on, like, 65th Street. I wear a fanny pack. I don't wear a purse at all. I actually have a concealed weapons license. I mean... It's sort of crazy what's going on in New York City. I bike mostly in the park because I'm like, you know what? I don't want to walk in that park without my big dog with me. It's It's gone a little nutty. I mean, it's not as bad as the media makes it out to be. I'd say there's some over-sensationalism, but, you know, it's not the New York it used to be. Like, I tell my husband he should run for mayor. I'm like, this is enough. Like, it is just crazy what the city's come down to. And, you know, we're over flooded with, you know, people that the city's paying for who don't have homes, they don't work, and they're not paying taxes, and it's killing our city. It's a shame what is going on. And, you know, government's got to change our city council has to change how they're looking at this, and the government has to change. But, you know, New York City is a sanctuary state, so they, Texas sent everyone to us, and yeah. it's... It's look, I'm all pro immigration, but I'm like legalize people, get them working, get hardworking citizens out there. You know, we need a lot of people, but it's hard to function in a society that's not safe. So, sad. You, know, you, you just, I just went to Iceland where there's zero crime, <laughs> nothing. Although you're in Iceland. <laughs> all right. I want to get into the whiskey of it, but you, since you mentioned Iceland, uh, before we start recording, I told you about my hellhole vacation that I just went on. Uh, and I know you love to travel. You mentioned the aforementioned cities. You, you have places in. If you were to, if someone were to randomly come up to you in in a, in let's say in a nice New York, a random conversation yeah. where you'd have to worry about anyone hurting you, and they said, "Julie, I want to go on vacation. Where should I go? Where would you suggest someone go on vacation?" They say, "Because I'm reading a lot about. And I don't know if you've seen this, Julie, that the fact that." most pl- like vacation tour spots have become too crowded. Like millennials and Gen Z's don't like to buy shit anymore. They just spend all their money on travel. And so all these travel destinations are just way yeah. too crowded. So tell so me. I feel that way. So that is why I went to Iceland. In fact, Bloomberg actually had an article about like Scandinavia is the new place to go because it's cooler and like no one's there. Um, I personally love Aspen. Don't go there because there are too many people there and the tourists <laughs> do annoy me. And I do have a home there. And I'm like, oh my God, it's becoming like Riff Raff City there. So don't go to Aspen, but it's the best place. <laughs> right. Um, in terms of actual, like, I like to travel more off the beaten path. So if I'm doing a vacation, like one of my favorite vacations I went on was like Easter Island, where is I think the most remote place past Papua New Guinea off of Chile. 
you fly wow. there, so it's quite the adventure to get there. Um, I liked going to Inner Mongolia. I like Korea, um, Borneo. So, you know, I, I'm into like, my view is like if I'm going to go on a plane and make the effort to go on vacation, and it's not like London, Paris, or like right. a normal spot, I'm going to go for it. <laughs> so I just went to the Troll Peninsula, which was like the most northern part in Iceland for vacation, which it was the coldest vacation I've ever had. So I'm not <laughs> sure I would recommend it. Right. But, or if you go bring a ski suit, which is the one item I asked. I'm like, do I need a ski suit? And they're like, no, you don't need a ski suit. The only thing I needed was a ski suit. <laughs> wow. Did you end up buying one just in case? Just to they have? didn't even sell them up there. I oh, wish God. they had. But I do like like Isla Scotland, which is an island off Scotland. It's great. Like, I love the more like, if you're going to do it. By the way, I know you just went on a cruise ship and didn't have the best experience. But I will say I do love cruise ships because they give you the ability to sort of like go to many places at once and see like remote locations. And for that, I love cruise ships. Like Croatia, you can do by cruise ship and a lot of other cool destinations. Okay, all right, cool, I'll make a, I'll make a note. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, we've mentioned whiskey a couple times this conversation and sort of the journey you've taken. That you're the, not, you're the anti-socialite. You're a socialite, but you actually do a lot of stuff. You know. Um, <laughs> the latest is the whiskey that we mentioned. And obviously it's, Part of like your DNA, you you talk about smuggling it into the, the Met Gala. Uh, can you tell me about that love of whiskey? Because you even mentioned it, like a lot of women, have, you know, that you, when you started were were not whiskey drinks, and more and more women are are now experimenting with brown spirits. But what? When did you fall in love with with like a brown spirit? How did that? Yeah. Come into so life? for me, it was like always the novelty. So I was working in finance, lived in Asia, actually lived in Korea between Hong Kong and Korea and Singapore. And I remember seeing in these management meetings of all guys and me. And like the way to fit in was like, have a glass of whiskey with them and smoke a cigar. I don't smoke cigars anymore, but you know, that was like the assimilation culture. And I remember like I'd work 24 seven and part of my job was actually like to pour the whiskey for the men on the management team Get them so drunk they'd pass out in the street in Korea. <laughs> this is when this was allowed. I'd crack at the model all night. I think I'd sleep on average two and a half hours and show up by 8 a.m. And, you know, I still remember, like, that was the culture. Like, you would work 24-7. My assistant would be there till, like, 10 p.m. It was, that was the finance bro culture. And that's why I really started, you know, I'd work all the time. So I'd spend my dinner allowance basically on a bottle of wine, champagne, or whiskey from the duty-free or the gift shop because I didn't have time to even eat barely. So right. I, I remember like starting to hoard little bottles in my tiny little studio apartment. Fast forward, I moved back to New York City. I was you know 24, met my husband then. I joke, I discovered his Amex got married and whiskey auctions all in the same year. And I really, that <laughs> my collection exploded and that's where i really started to collect um the other day i opened in my um closet in that room you saw which is entire 19th floor bubblegum pink and red designed by annabelle seldor for our collection i opened one of the wood closets which are filled with either ball gowns or whiskey i was like wow i have 12 like 1974 gordon mcfail glenn livets here like, I just found them. Like, I probably got them, you know, two decades ago, but I forgot <laughs> I had them. So, you know, it was really, and I still do actively buy at the auctions, but it really was an exploration of buying what I like. And, you know, I started with the McAllen and, and Oban, but then I found I really liked the more peaty stuff. So it became like an Ardbeg or, um, you know, a Beaumore or a Lefroy and uh, I was in places like Maison du Whiskey in Paris, and every time I'd stop, I remember why I came back from Isla with my husband. I think that's who was 2018. I remember the customs agents. We had a whole giant suitcase filled with whiskeys. And they're like, <laughs> what? And I declare everything. And they're like, what are you doing with like 40 bottles of whiskey? And I'm like, well, obviously I just collect them. I'm like, there's no duplicates. And they're like, yeah, I guess she just collected them and they let me go through. But it was like, wow. I think they I thought I lost my mind. But it's really just like something I love drinking. 
I love the experience of exploring different whiskeys and having friends over and being like, have you tried this or that? It was in putting actually my own collection away in my own bar that I realized that, you know, things like 1939 Old Elgin, Irish, Canadian, Japanese, Taiwanese, but there was nothing made in the U.S. that was 100% malted barley, water, and yeast that was a single malt that was high-end that would be in my collection. And so that was the whole genesis of this idea. It was like, oh, I'm going to make like a scotch made in America because that hadn't existed. And I remember I went and sat with um, Joey Magliocco and Smictors and John Sr. who runs Empire. And this was six years ago or so. And I was like, hey, I have this crazy idea. I want to do like American single malt. They're like, we have no idea what you're talking about. We don't <laughs> know what that is. But they're like, if you do it, we'll back, you know, we'll, we'll bring you into the market. And that was probably even a year prior to laying down the liquid. So maybe even seven years ago. Needless to say, like six months ago, I had lunch with John Sr. He's like, Julie, I thought you had lost your mind. Jack Daniels, Bullet, Jim Bean, they're all in this American single mall thing. This is a real category. Wow. <laughs> What's crazy is it's still not an approved category officially by TTB. So we're still, I think, in inning zero here, which is rare that you have that in alcohol and beverage, right? Where it's actually brand new category. And it's really, you know, allowed a lot of inventive ideas as, because it's not regulated. Which, so it's fun. Wow. Now, when you went into it, because I know sometimes folks that have done very well, it's almost like the world of VC where like you throw the spaghetti against the wall and if a couple stick, you've got you've got you know success on your hands. Was this like, for lack of a word, a lark or were you like, no, 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 I'm going in full board knowing. You know, That's how a to great question. So yeah. I think, you know, look, given my cosmetics experience, I was like, oh, I know how to do packaging and marketing. I know how to make stuff and put in product. Um, it was COVID then. I remember I showed a friend my original bottle. He's like, Julie, that bottle's terrible. It's stock packaging. He's like, there's nothing about you that's stock. He's like, redo it. And so I sketched on a piece of paper like this idea of a flask because I even have a flask for the bartender's name at the mark that says Hamid, I need to drink because I always take a flask with me and I'm always terrified of being without good alcohol. So I want like Tom Ford meets a flask. And that's where the bottle design came from. If you really look at it and I can make it in any color, you know, it's patented and we came up with it um, because I want like this idea of jewelry and flask and like high luxury. I was doing it for myself and my friends to start. I'm not going to lie. It was like, oh, I, I love whiskey. I want to do American one. I started laying down some barrels. I laid down like 25 barrels the first time. That was like, oh, you know, if I'm going to really do this and now I'm ordering packaging, maybe I should make a few more barrels. So I you know, then laid down 75. Then I was like, oh, maybe I'll lay down a little more. So to date, you know, as of the end of this year, and I heard from the guys at Balcones and they're like a $50 million business, that they have about 6,000 barrels of American single malt. Not sure if that's true. That's what, you know, somebody over there told me. Um, we'll have about 2,000 barrels of American single malt at the end of this year. So, you know, not all age, but it obviously just became more and more serious. Like, it was like, at first, like, oh, I'm going to go launch our private collection where 200 bottles reserved just, you know, at my 45th birthday, it was for friends. We had a giant ice cake, cake, we had a giant ice sculpture, you know, Ramona Singer was there. It was a thousand of my friends. It was like, oh, we'll call it the Maplow Whiskey Lodge. I had 10 bottles of whiskey at the entire party. <laughs> we went through 200 bottles of Cristal. Like, wow. I'm just saying because we didn't yeah, have enough. enough. Yeah. We just didn't have enough. And we brought out these reserve casks, which I acquired out of Oregon, actually, which are single casks, just to sort of get the branding and the marketing out there. So it started as like really a thing for me and my friends is the real answer here. That's so cool. And then it like started to take on. And then finally our liquid was like ready. It's like, oh, this is a real like project and it's a real company. And we've got, I don't know, today about 600 points of distribution in five major cities, New York, Dallas, Vegas, you know, 
Miami, Lobin, Beverly Hills. And then we're launching um, Arai, which was finished in American Single Malts, and you're the first to see it. And this is going to come out um, September, which is like super exciting. Nice. Because, you know, we're the first to ever take Arai and barrel it in American Single Malt and finish it. So there's this ability to be like, innovators in a category and people are like oh how did you think about it i do work with brendan mccarran who's out of ardbeg glen Ranji, um distilled bonahaben one of the best master blenders he had introduced me originally to ian mcmillan who just retired who was 50 years in the business um who did deanston um everyone knows him and basically but that idea came from me. I was sitting in my shower. I'm like, hey, we've got a bunch of rye. Like, why don't we, like, finish off American single malt? Wow. So I think there's something about being an outsider in an insider's industry that's given me a weird advantage. Even in the way, like, I go into the market and I'm working the market. And everyone's like, I remember I met the guys from McCown. They're like, we see you against our balls everywhere. Like, how did you do that? <clears throat> I'm like, I personally go in and sell every single bottle. Wow. Not every single, but a lot of them. And these are places and restaurateurs like Jean George launched us initially everywhere. He's a friend of ours. Like wow. Dan Chef Danielle Ballou, who I've event with next week, also a good friend. So we we have the benefit that like we already have been in New York City for 20 years. Maybe this goes back to the socialite thing. <laughs> but really, you know knew the people, knew the players, knew the restaurateurs. So we were able to sort of leverage off a lot of these existing great relationships, which I think with a well-known name, the Maclo wasn't like a name I had to explain to anyone. So that helped it. And it's a, obviously very personal. You mentioned in the name of the, of the, of the liquid is Maclo. Um, but what people don't, who aren't involved in like the beverage or the spirit space is to really grow and get capital. It's, mostly through acquisition, and I know this is super personal to you, do you ever foresee a time where, like, one of these big boys comes and says, like, hey, Julie, I know uh, this is this is your baby, but would you would you ever, you know, sell, you know, Maclo to us? Is that, I mean, I know this is, you're still early on in this. Yeah, but so I, I, look, right now we're just actually starting our Series A. I think it's going to get done pretty quickly, um, hopeful, optimistic at this point. Um the goal is right now not to do that, but I think eventually you have to partner with a strategic once you get to a certain scale yeah. to really get to the next level. Um, we had thought about doing it at this point. I think it's too premature, but I think to really look, I want the Maclo whiskey to be a household name. I want my kids to be like my grandma. She, you know, is sitting <laughs> there in the ride, you know? but I'm just kidding. You know, I think to really grow any company, not just mine, you have to be able to have the right investors, the right partners, and to really scale. What a company needs when they're a small little startup like mine, let's say zero to 20 million sales, is very different than what a company needs when they're 50 to 100 million in sales, right? Different management team often, different capital needs, different partnership needs. So. I never like to say never because I feel like you just never know. And it's too hard to predict. Obviously, my goal as a founder is to, you know, keep the most equity as I can, but of a successful company. So, you know, it's better to have a smaller piece of something that's quite large right. than 100% of something quite small, right? Yeah. So, you know, I'd say it's a delicate dance and you know a lot of people are like what you're raising money now it's like the worst time you could go raise money but the reality is you know i think we built a really unique and interesting brand in the luxury sector and we have had huge amounts of interest actually from financials and strategics because it is white space and i think you know this is probably the first raise, but it's probably not the last raise. I did basically the seed capital my, with my husband on our own. Wow. So, you know, we had no seed round because, you know, for better or for worse, we funded that ourselves. <laughs> wow. That's so, and in terms of 
the I know when you were first introduced, and I think I I spoke to you when you first launched the the first bottle, which I think was like it was like fifteen hundred dollars a bottle or something like that. And then, yes. And, and now the other ones, yeah, there it is. The other ones have gotten a little more affordable. So that seems like a conscious decision to yes. to get the masses, right? And actually, what's really cute is we just launched out, and if you can see it size, oh yeah, these two hundred mLs for hotels. So this went into just the best hotels. So like Coffee and Rose, the Mark, the Jerome and Aspen, um, the Ritz downtown at um, Phuket's. Like that has been great because these go on mini bars and they come across at like $85, $95. So it lets people sample it without, you know, having to go put it for a $1,500 bottle. Um, the goal with the rye, obviously our gold bottle, it's still expensive at two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars, but our rye should be priced closer to probably eighty, okay, five to a hundred dollars, just depending where you're getting it. And then eventually, you know, our goal is to have a bourbon a little bit less, even. So, you know, we have some special additions we're working on. Am I looking to be mass? No, you know, we're batching out ten barrels at a time. That's not my goal. My goal is to have the highest quality liquid, the best packaging, everything's hand signed. It's a luxury product. We put our sweat and tears. The highest woods are used. I see, you know, Cooper Select 18 month air dry barrels. We're selecting only casts that get four and a half out five stars. So every cast that goes in there has to be the right one. There's a lot of stuff you can buy that's $40 on shelf. That's not my goal. I right. think we're always going to hover, you know, I don't really see our brand going much below $85. It's it's still going to be something that, you know, you have to be a connoisseur, you have to appreciate a luxury item. You, you know, no different than why somebody goes and buys a Chanel lip gloss or a Chanel jacket, right? You care about the craftsmanship. That's so cool. I, I, I'm just a random question. Did you ever feel like Aaron Brockovich and the, I know it's kind of a weird kind of thing, but like Aaron Brockovich, I remember the movie, like they would see this woman and she would be like very normal. Then all of a sudden, like know all this legalese. And in this world of brown spirits, which is very male, when you come in with all this knowledge, I mean, I'll be honest with Julie, half the words you talk about when you talk about bourbon, they might as well be Greek to me. But like, do you blow people away? Like, whoa, this lady knows her stuff. I think they're confused, honestly. It's like, <laughs> wait, the socialite has words? How is that possible? <laughs> it's like it's like this weird juxtaposition. Of yeah. like, wait, no, women can't speak? That's not possible? <laughs> like, um, there is, look, it takes me in many ways back to my finance career, right, which is so male-dominated. And in a weird way, I remember I'd like have these like short skirts Chanel with thigh high boots. I'd walk into a management meeting and they're like, who are you and why are you here? Like, you're not a hooker. We're not paying you. You work for the company. Like, we're so confused. I, I definitely get that similar, very confused response. I would say um, it's still very highly dominated male industry. There are fabulous women in this industry. Not enough. Hopefully more are coming. Um, you know, but I've been fortunate that the guys and a lot of the men that are in this industry, there's been some great advocates and some people who are really pro seeing women in this industry and, you know, have been great champions of our brand and super helpful. Um, just like any other thing you could do, there's also some people who like to wield their little power tool and, you know, be idiots for no reason when it's just not necessary. But, you know, my general view is to try and kill them with kindness. And, you know, there's definitely some very difficult people in this industry who, you know, think because they're a buyer and they control certain decisions that they're just going to be difficult. But the reality is life is full of difficult people. And part of the challenge is learning how to, you know, navigate your way around that. And I always say, you know, no just means just not right now. So if somebody doesn't want the whiskey today, maybe they will tomorrow. So try and keep the door open. Awesome. Well, that's great. Julie, it's always a pleasure talking to you. I'm going to be back in New York in September. So hopefully I'll be there in town when you guys do your, your next rollout. But it's always great talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, you know, cheers. Go drink some Maclo and check out that website, themaclo.com. We have everything up there if you're interested. 
Burr, I'm already getting the chills from, from looking right. at the website. <laughs> Take care. Thank Bye. You, Take care. Bye. And that's going to do it for episode one of season two of Good Listen. I'm Joe Partavilla. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to shoot me a note, you can tell me your story at Joe Partavilla at ProtonMail.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, please, if you can, hit that big old thumbs up button and hit subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you are listening on Apple, Spotify, or any of those podcast platforms, leave us a five-star review. I would greatly appreciate it. Until next time, I will see you then. Adios.